Welcome to today's online, um, online talk by, by Simon Peters from Dicus Network. And the topic it is investing in Bitcoin, why and how for family offices. Um, Simon and I are super excited to have you here. And before I hand over to him, just a quick logistics um, thing, which is questions. If you have any questions or you want to interact with Simon, just post them in this group. He's also in the group, I'm in the group, so we can see these questions. Um, if there is time, Simon can answer them right away. If there isn't, then um, as I said, he's in the group and we always encourage everyone, the speakers and you as the participant to carry on the conversation even after the talk is over because we only have 45 minutes today. Um, so join this group and then you can keep asking these questions and Simon will answer even, even after 9.45 today. If you struggle to scan the QR code, no problem. In the email you receive with a Zoom link, there's also the WhatsApp link. You just click on it, it opens, you're in the group and you can ask your questions. That's it from my side, uh, from the Disrupt side. I'll now hand over to Simon and I hope you enjoy this talk. Today our topic is uh, investing in Bitcoin, why and how for family offices. And uh, my name is Simon Peters. Um, you can already, if you like, uh, add me on LinkedIn if you, if you think uh, anyway, want to talk to me about that topic. And um, yes, I'm the managing director of Dico's Network. Uh, Dico's Network is a daughter company of Bloxus Capital, which is another startup. So we are a group of companies. There's a third company called Mukobo. And what we're trying to do as a group of companies is covering a lot of the, the, the space where, where we need solutions right now. So Mikobo is a, is a company that consults you um, for security um, token issuance and, and other things. Boxes Capital is a, is a trading uh, desk, basically the, the main product and, and Dicus is a custody desk, if you like. And I will talk a lot more about all of that in detail very, very much later on into that presentation. The topic for today or how the concept from today is that we go from small to big and that I give you in this 45 minutes a, a high level overview of, of everything you would need to set up your custody infrastructure, uh, your, your, your digital asset infrastructure to hold and trade digital assets. And I go from zero to one here. So the first half will be oriented around a lot of basics and the second half will be oriented a lot of, uh, around a more high level, more complex issues. And the reason why I do that is since I'm working in this ecosystem, I, I, I've been on so many conferences and I've seen so many workshops and so many talks. And we often talk about the, the barrier that we need to overcome for mass adoption. And for me personally, I think there have been so many smart things said out there, what are, what are barriers? But the barrier that I personally see, and I'm very happy to act on it, is, is communication in our ecosystem. Because we live, this is a very complex um, market and it's developing faster and faster. And I often feel there are many, many people out there who, who are also excited about this technology and, and all the opportunity that it has. But when then they, they come to events, then they find themselves in a position where all the speakers and in all the topics already so much in the detail of the things that it's very hard for them to grasp. It, it, it's a bit like if you start to learn math or physics, you don't start with, 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 with the last chapter in the book, but with the first one. And uh, so this is our concept for today. Um, it will be a quite high level summary. And I want to invite you already, and I will post it right now in, in the chat. If you feel that all of this is a little bit too high level and you want to go more in detail after the talk, um, we offer you that we do um, one on one Zoom work workshops or in small groups um, where you can sign up, uh, where you can talk to us and we can talk together about the needs of your organization and then create, um, yeah, lie out a little bit how your path forward could look like. And I just posted that in the, in the WhatsApp group um, that you're all in. I'm just starting quickly. Okay, now let's get started. So I separated this workshop or this talk today in, in three chapters. The first one is the basics. Um, if you have experience in, in the industry already, if you, if you know what you're doing, if you're managing crypto, fund anything, I think these won't be that interesting for you. However, the second and the third part might be very well interesting to you because we, um, I speak a little bit about our experience and, and what for challenges we see when you set up an infrastructure and give a little bit hints where you definitely have to look out. And I will be very, very honest here and tell you everything that I've learned over the, over the last year working in this industry. 
And uh, the last part will be, of course, I want to talk a little bit about Decos, and of course, I want to talk a little bit about our uh, mother company, Roxas Capital, and their flagship product core, simply because I really believe that we have built the right solution for, for this market. But let's go straight forward and straight into it and, and start with the basics. <clears throat> um, the blockchain, uh, this marvelous artifact of human ingenuity that we all talk about, and it's often so confused what it exactly it is and how it works. And I, and I do think it is important to basically understand how it works, to understand why it is so secure and why its features are so quote unquote disruptive, so so game changing. And um, yeah, quick, quick recap, why is it called blockchain? We have, uh, because we talk about blocks that are chained together. And a single block is a it's kind of a, it's a collection of transaction histories of transactions that have happened. Um, this block is uh, stamped with a time. So we see when it happened and it has a hash. A hash is, uh, is a string of numbers and, and letters that's produced from a hash function, which is derived out of the, the very transactions that are in the block. So every block is, uh, is composed out of many different transactions and the hash then um, comes out of that uh, based on ha hash function. And so what happens now is that, that a single block does not only has its own hash, but also its previous hashes and thereby it's, it's linked together. You see, um, Right here, you, you, you see the, the block before, and then you know, okay, the previous hash was um, E3BOC. And so we know, okay, these ones are linked together. And so this is a very um, intuitive way of, of technically linking these things together. And of course, now when I go now in and I would change something of the transaction history of the transaction record, my hash would change and I would see, okay, this block doesn't fit actually anymore into the chain. There has been, there has been a cut or anything else. And this is, so the hashes are the reason why, um, or is the, is the one side of the reason why the blockchain is safe. And the other one is that these chains are um, decentralized. It means there are many, many different nodes that all have their own chains. And of course, you could manipulate one chain if you just would have had one. But by having so many chains all around the world that, that all have the same record, we can immediately identify if something has changed or if some, some fraudulent activity has been, been made. And so this is the blockchain, very basically explained. And this is how it works. And this is why it is so safe. And so what, what makes it so special besides being safe? Um, the first reason is, or I get often asked, hey, Simon, um, blockchain is fine, it's cool, but I can already have stocks on my phone and I already have money on my phone. Why is it so special now to do with blockchain? And the reason is that when you have, of course, your stocks or your, 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 your bank balance on a phone is actually not on your phone. It's a bank and it, it shows you an interface and shows you what they have, what they safeguard for you. And now this really changes with blockchain because if you have a wallet on your phone, you don't see an interface. Of course, you also see an interface, but the it's not a middleman holding a thing for you but the asset is so to say technically really on your phone in that wallet um which is you really own it and this is the difference you know it's not a it's not a middle party anymore that, that holds the ownership for you and it gives you access and, and shows you what it's doing but you own it yourself um and this is a it's not a direct visible um difference but it is a huge difference when it comes to the implication it has the second why it is why it's so special is because this ledger, as I just explained, can be trusted. And this is and trust is, is, is something that we have struggled since the inception of, of, of our species to, to really institutionalize. And this is the first time ever that we really can institutionalize trust. And of course, the system is extremely, extremely stable to, due to its decentralization, because even if, if we lose one of these chains or even two, um, as long as we have uh, have a, have at least one left the system still works better too but yeah um and of course the blockchain and the bitcoin is not the same this is um, also a huge uh difference the bitcoin has been only the very first workable blockchain that has been uh, gone to public and that's why we have often this 
uh, questionable association with blockchain and Bitcoin. But the blockchain is much, much more. The blockchain is a basic technology and you can build many things on it. One of it is, of course, the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. The other one is tokens, which I will explain a little bit uh, in detail more, as well as smart contracts. Uh, when it comes to the cryptocurrencies, we of course have the Bitcoin, which is with over 100 billion uh, US dollars market capitalization, a considerable um, player that, that you have to that you have to acknowledge. The second bigger one is, is Ethereum, and of course you have a lot of old coins. So this is many, many, many different coins that have come up uh, in the internet uh, with about almost 30 billion capitalization. But but the most relevant are, are the two. We can for now gladly ignore the old coins. So I want to focus on the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin is very much a coin, so it's very much um, built to work like a coin. While Ethereum is a little bit different. Ethereum is more of a platform. You can put things on the Ethereum chain, um, a lot of smart contracts, a lot of uh, security tokens now run via the Ethereum chain, a feature that Bitcoin does not offer. So in a sense, Ethereum is the technology technically um, most sophisticated, more advanced um, player out here. However, um, there, there are some things that make the Bitcoin still special over, over any, anything else. One is, of course, the market capitalization. But on the other end, Bitcoin has a beautiful story in the end of, of its inception, almost a mystery. And it makes it very, it gives, them, it, gives it another meaning. While Ethereum, we know very well the organization that is behind of it. And, uh, which makes it also a little bit centralized. So, so Bitcoin does have its own strengths that make it very unique and it will keep making it or being unique uh, over, over in the future as well. So the next one is security token. What are security tokens? Security tokens are, again, imagine the blockchain, you have all the blocks and now you put boxes on, on top of the, of the blockchain and in these boxes, you can put ownership, ownership of anything. Uh, intellectual property rights, company share, land titles, artworks, whatever, whatever, whatever you imagine. And the beautiful thing about it, about putting ownership into security tokens compared to traditional register, like a land title register or um, an artwork re register, is that it is much faster if you want to make transactions um, because you are you're not depending on the notary or on to, on, on, on other. Um, analog systems, but also because the first time in, in history we can divide things that have been very difficult to be divided. One example might be an artwork. Uh, I love the idea you, you have a mansion, um, maybe a family business, and now you, you struggle a little bit uh, with financing your mansion, and, and, but you don't want to sell it because it is, it is a family property. So it would be a great shock to you and your, your family to, to, to let go of it. And so you might just liquidize 10% of, of that asset. Um, sell it out and then you know pay a rent arrangement for these ten percent, but it but it keeps you more in control. You can choose how much. It, it's not anymore all or nothing, but you have you, you can go in, in little steps and, and make your decisions. However, when it comes to security tokens and, and this workshop or this this talk is practical. I, I wanna wanna help you to find your way right now. And security tokens are amazing. Security tokens are the future, but currently there are no really secure, there are no security tokens markets with deep liquidity. So this will come up in the next years, it will become big, it will become massive. But right now it's still something that is uh, it's in an immature state. It is on a rise and it will come, but for now there, there, there's no real big trading going on here. Next one is, uh, is the smart uh, contracts, which is, again, mostly or mainly put on the Ethereum blockchain. It, it's a contract written in code. And why is it nice to have a contract written in code? It's because you can have a trigger event that is also communicated via code and then execute whatever is written in the contract. And it's a very, it's an even more complex idea and it will play out mainly in, uh, in, in, in complex industries, I believe. There's a lot of saying that we have um, mixed smart contracts at one point, you know, with our coffee machine. I uh, might happen, but but where I right now in the next two, three years, uh, five years, see the big advantage of smart contracts is, is complex industries, like supply chains, like internal markets, uh, between company groups. And the reason for that being that to give an example, you have a you have a long you have a long complex supply chain, and now you have a you have a demand change, maybe an uptake or a downtake. And so, 
the, the change in demand is registered and now the machines can on their own within seconds make new agreements about how to buy, what they're buying, what will be the, the utilization of certain machines, of certain lines. And this is just an incredible um, idea because it makes things so much quicker in, uh, in, in reaction time and it will decrease, for example, bullwhip effects um, a lot more. So this, is, this was the first basic section. Now the big question, um, why, why you should invest into Bitcoin? And, and I will give you three reasons why and, and one reason uh, why you should not um, to make it, to make it uh, honest. And the first one is why you, should, why you really should invest maybe into Bitcoin or consider it is uh, to hedge against rich, uh, to hedge against crisis. You have to know that the Bitcoin was criticized very much in the beginning because it is detached from the world economy almost completely. And this is true, but this is actually more of a virtue than it is of a vice because there are certain, when we, when I, when we analyze industries or markets or portfolios, we of course know their, 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 their systems, right? Like we have, we have in certain industries and then we look at the automotive industries and a lot of suppliers and it, and it all hangs together. And that of course cause, causes systematic risks that our, that our economy builds upon each other. And when we, when we have no system shock, um, in, in a certain industry, uh, and you have, for example, a very industry heavy portfolio, having a small allocation of Bitcoin can be, can be your bet against your own portfolio. That means when, when there's a major economic downturn that affects the systematic build um, part of the economy, there's a good chance it might not affect the Bitcoin. And yeah, th this is why we have seen, we have seen some case studies, all these case studies, uh, also, we are also, of course, I have to see with a little bit of doubt because they've done the, the, the time of the Bitcoin has been quite wild. So when we see calculations that it significantly enhances the cumulative return of a portfolio, is of course a very positive phrasing, uh, but it is still true. And why is it true? Um, when we see from 2019 and uh, from 2012 to 2019, um, in of record about the correlation from Bitcoin. Again, the Bitcoin is not completely uncorrelated to the rest of the economy, but it is much less correlated than all other um, big asset classes to each other. And this is something, this is just a mathematical fact. You can play with you uh, in your portfolio, make some calculations, let play around a little bit with, with portfolio theory. This is a very good reason why one should consider to invest into Bitcoin. The other one is, is absolutely security. We have heard so much about stolen digital assets from custodians, from exchanges, and there have been so many headlines about it, but this is always a, a third party mistake. So someone else took care of your coins and, and, and then they lost it. However, given that you have your own wallet and that you keep, uh, safeguard your own keys, um, it's, it's impossible that, that someone can steal your, your coins. And with impossible, I mean, Really, nobody can. No bank, no government, no supranational institution. And this is also something. Of course, we all believe in in, in our environment and in the systems that we live in. But one just needs to put on CNN to see that we we are coming in more and more unstable times, and unstable times do cause um, waves and ripple effects. And this is something. What you can also keep in mind: maybe it is good to have an asset with a few, with a small distribution in your portfolio that it is kind of a final security to whatever happens. And the third reason why I think it's a good idea to now think about investing into Bitcoin and setting up an infrastructure like that is, I talked about security tokens and I'm 100% convinced security tokens will be the future and many other experts are too. And so Bitcoin is kind of the, the sweet cherry to pick, uh, to put, to start putting your toes into the water of, of this new infrastructure and it is kind of a rewarding um, a little re reward you get for exploring now this this area and, and um, setting up an infrastructure that you will need in the future anyway so one reason why should not invest into Bitcoin and I do think this is uh, something that also needs to be um, watched carefully is it's very hard to say if a Bitcoin is right now expensive or cheap, 
because there's no there's no event in the life cycle of the bitcoin that gives a payout there's no interest there's no dividends and so that means we can't use a discounted cash flow model to, to evaluate the coin and this is in fact it is, a, it is a real problem. It is something that you have to keep in mind. And it is something that kind of makes the Bitcoin unattractive. However, I, I think the question of time is, if the market matures and we are in an immature market, uh, and I will repeat that a few times in, in this presentation, um, we will see some lending picking up and we will see few of this. Um, and in, in a moment, of course, if lending kicks off, okay, we, have, we will see potential interest rates. And so this will come, I'm very convinced of it. But for now, um, whenever you are, you have to make this investment decision. Um, you have to kind of rely on other data, and this is something you have to keep in mind because it means to to start thinking where do I could get these kinds of data from. So that was the basic part now, and I want to go now from the very basics to how could concretely look an infrastructure or how will an infrastructure look like, and what do I have to look out for. And to make it very easy, so we have, we have, imagine your family office or you're, you're an asset manager, you're in the center, um, and you need two sides, right? You need to have uh, access to the exchange. You need to have access to the place where you can buy, where you can exchange fiat for, for crypto, and you need to have access to custody, where do you save your assets. And of course, these are more back-end functions. You need one interface to work with it. And I want to go now through the challenges that come out of it. So the first step is, of course, where do I buy my, my, my assets? And buying assets is in theory easy, but there are a lot of um, pitfalls that you should avoid. And the first one is to start thinking about exchanges. There are right now more than 500 exchanges for crypto assets um, out in the market. They created a very intransparent network. So these, trend, these, these markets range from very established uh, players like Coinbase, or uh, the Börse Stuttgart to mere startups um, in, a, in a garage somewhere uh, around the world. And of course, it's, it's less professional in exchange is, it's more risk is associated with it. And how professional or not professional exchange is, is not really, must not be visit, visible immediately. The second one is um, the, the trading price of assets varies across. Um, um, I just saw I got, uh, got a message on WhatsApp. I will divide, I will answer the, I will answer the questions after the call, uh, get towards the end of the, of the conversation. Uh, I hope that is good for all of you. Um, exactly. So exactly the, the, pricing, the trading price between um, the different exchanges varies quite a lot. And the reason for that, uh, or there's no particular reason for it, but this, of course, an arbitrage opportunity is not always an opportunity if you pay the wrong price. So you you should you should avoid being uh, being the one that creates the arbitrage opportunity and rather uh, take advantage of it. And this is also something you have to keep in mind. And probably the biggest problem, if you think about an institutional arrangement in in this area, is that most exchanges or actually no real exchange can offer you. Um, at all times, access to deep liquidity. So to, in, in worst case, you happen to be a whale to just change the price if you set bigger orders. And this is of course something you want to avoid because you don't want the same like the arbitrage opportunity. You don't want to pay a higher price than it is necessary. Um, so, so far to the exchange um, um, challenges. Now I won't go to the, to the custody challenges and of course, because now Work, work with custody. So I have a few more slides uh, on this part. Um, so the, the big three challenges is here again, you have a mark that is full of potential custodians. There's very intransparent offerings and, and little regulations. Um, you can depend on a single custodian, but that increases your odds of critical system failure. So what do you do when your only custodian has a downtime, but you want to trade? Um, and the last one is, is more of a practical thing is that moving funds between different interfaces and different, let's say you have your three custodians and you have one extra and the moving them manually is just something that is so error prone that it's unacceptable for a professional context. So we have to take care of all these challenges. First of all, I, I want to go to the potential market and I, and I really, for all the people here that really think about setting up such an infrastructure, I heavily recommend you to check out this website, 
digitalasset-custody.com because what it does is it lists you a lot of custodians and I think it is, it is a, it's a teachable experience. You just go through it and see how many there are. And all of them um, promise you the same, but in fact, all of them, or most of them use very different technologies. There's some of them that use uh, already established cloud, uh, wall cloud systems to store your keys. There are other ones that work on own technology. Then there, then there are third custodians who, who really work on something completely new called uh, multi-party computing, a, a system where you not even store keys anymore, but create them in a moment they are. They are, uh, they are they're needed. And so this creates a, there's a ton of custodians out there, a little bit the same problem with the exchanges. You can't really see who is really professional, who is not, and also who has a technology that is really still there in five years, or who has over-engineered something, or who has maybe promised a little bit too much. And this, as I said, it, it creates just a market that is intransparent and it's very hard to understand. You need a lot of effort to go into it and really feel who of them, who are the people I, I can trust and, and who are the people maybe that, that I should for now avoid. And um, the other one is custody. Every custodian tries to position himself very well and it's of course a, a, a good thing to do. However, they are... Um, Custody in the end is a commodity. And there might be a lot of different versions of custody like hot storage, cold storage. So hot storage is something that you can access immediately. Cold storage is something where you have a higher security, but you have a harder um, accessibility of your assets. But in the end, if your coins are safe, your coins are safe, it's, it's sand, it's a commodity. And we had before um, custody, critical commodities, digital commodities that we hard to integrate in our, in our economy. And this is cloud computing. And cloud computing has been, you know, in the 2000, five years ago, it has been a big thing. And they, again, when it comes to cloud um, providers, people or the big e-commerce or the big, big consumers of, of internet storage, notice again the problem is they depend on a single server farm with a single provider, they are at risk. Because when, it, when they go down, the business goes down too. And so they, back in the day, developed already something which is kind of a switch that you rely on more than a single um, cloud provider um, utilizing the systems optimal. And <clears throat> so if you depend on a single one, it's just very dangerous. And it always has been. Just quickly. Yeah. Um, so if you're, if, you're, if you're standing right now as, a, as, a, as an asset manager, uh, you can do basically three choices. The first one is okay, I create my own tech. Uh, I get my, maybe found a corporate venture, um, get my own people to be really sure. Um, but as, of course, there's a distraction of the core business, which you can do, but it's inherently risky. The other one is okay, you go out and look for, for a good partner that you really trust and try to make an arrangement. Um, but again, we are in an immature startups uh, uh, market, almost all companies out there are startups and if you, commit to a single provider, you are in danger of a lock-in. You are in a danger that a uh, custodian that looks now very good might not deliver on what you really need or want five years down the line. And when you make these contractual agreements or when you have invested massively into technology to integrate them, you, you, you run in danger of, of being locked in and, and paid try, price price. And this is why we at Decos in general believe that what we need is these middlewares that we have also developed for, for cloud-based solutions so that you have someone that does not, that allows you to work with, with several custodians at the same time. So this is um, so much to custody and now to interface challenges. So interface is, this is, is relevant because it is um, it's often forgotten. Of course, we have these backends that, that need to work, but um, if your interface doesn't work, the best backend doesn't 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 uh, uh, doesn't bring any use. And and I um, so is, with interface, I'm not mean strictly the technical definition, but rather what the what what the asset manager sees in the end. What is the most important part about the interface? First of all, is governance. And governance, of course, has been always be important for finance. But here it is even more important, simply because you have a system in which you directly re transfer real ownership. And back in the day, when, uh, when, you, when you missed a transaction, we had a, maybe a network of 50 bigger financial players that you could call up and trust it and, 
uh, and new and you could uh, you know fix mistakes however today if you if you if in this desire you send a wrong transaction and it goes out it might be irreversible and so there, there is a there's a need to create a better layer of governance and so you have to have these systems that are very strict in creating your your workflows and your who has the authority to do what um, how are trades double checked um, etc next very important from for, for interface so the main thing you are, you're using or you're seeing when you're working with them is the interoperability they are again it's an immature market and you will need tools that are not invented today uh, in, in maybe two years and if you now work with a with some kind of a, of a, of a cumulate, cumul, cumulating setup that is does not is not thought out in a way that it features this this oper interoperability, um, you will run into problems. And so when you when you look out and when you have conversations, which systems to use, um, really integrate people about the interoperability and do not only believe it. They say yes, it will be, but ask them how. How do you build your structure that is inherently or that that it features uh, interoperability to to systems that might not even exist yet. Um, and last ones, of course. Without downtimes, there's no no point in having maybe infrastructure if, if the button doesn't work uh, to set a trade, but kind of obvious one. And now I I do want to um, go a little bit. So the big level, the high level is understood, and now I want to come to how we at Geekos Network uh, and together with another company, Abraxas Capital, have thought about these problems and have created solutions tailored to exactly that. So you see the, the, the same kind of graphic again. Um, so we have divided it in uh, from blocks as um, the, the, the flagship product, which is called Core, and for Decus, uh, for Decus Network called Decus Hub. And I know I started before with act changes, but now we'll go to uh, the custody side because, of course, this is a Decus Network event, and so self custody. So. Um, what we are creating right now is, is just one interface where you can manage all your custody operations. And all your custody operations, you have to understand, this is what we call Decos Network. We are not a single custodian, but we, are, we have our Decos Hub and we go through the market, through the over 100 custodians and talk to the people that we really trust and that we believe have the highest standard of technology. And this is also our promise to you that we does the work in this immature in transparent market, that we have our experts, that we have our engineers, that we really look into the books and, and don't take any um, any promises, but but really look into what have they built, what is what is their capacity. And what does Decos now do? So first of all, it closes the gap. Um, you need exchanges and you need custody, and you don't want to transfer your fund manually. So this is the first thing we do. You can trade out of your custody. So why is it good to trade out of your custody? Because you don't want to have the funds on exchanges because it's just inherently more risky because exchanges like Coinbase accumulate so much capital in their own custody that they're the prime target for anyone who wants to, wants to have a target. Um, and of course, they're doing a lot of work to avoid that, but maybe, you know, maybe it's better to, to have your things on a custodians in Switzerland that almost nobody knows um, than on the main biggest uh, exchange. Um, so yeah, we're closing the gap uh, and, and also think about the settlement. Um, this is, okay, you might trade out of custody, but you also maybe um, make an OTC trade. So you want to first verify, have the other side um, really the assets that they want to sell me, can I pay it, and how do we execute the trade? And, and all of that because um, takes care of. Of course, we because we look so much into the custodians, I've already mentioned it, uh, you can rely on the best tag because we only take the custodians that are valid and give you the full freedom of arranging your custody infrastructure based on the features and based on your organizational needs. And because we have a set of different custodians, you reduce your inherent provider risk because now um, with Decos, you can automatically split all your assets across different different custodians, so you will never have the moment just because the sync custodian is down that you have to stop your operations. But you will have always sufficient funds spread across other things. So yeah, you're very secured against the worst thinkable um, events. 
So this is, of course, like this is the fundamental functions of, of DQs, and this is where we really put a lot of effort in. And it is like from a tech side, the 80% of our work. So there's another 20% which makes it specific tailored to, um, to family offices. So why, why do we, this is also why we're directed to family offices, is of course family offices have clients. And imagine you're a fund. If you are a fund, you might have, and work with DQs, you might um, have five to 10 different custodians uh, in, if, if, you, if you wanted to take it that far. But never, they, there would be no reason to have more of it. However, if you have different clients and you split the, 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 different, um, the different assets of the different clients across different custodians, a lot of wallets come together, you know, like the, the fund might have, you know, five to 10 bigger, you know, main wallets, so to say. But if you, if you work with clients and you have more than one, but you say maybe you have 10 clients, you know, the, the numbers adding up. So this is, a, is also an interface to have one place to see all your assets across all different um, custodians in one uh, unique interface. Uh, and you can see, okay, what every single client has um, in its own things. And you, and you have, of course, the, the view of an, uh, all assets under management. The second one is where we have very much looked into, into onto family offices is that uh, we put a lot of effort into creating software where you have an easy way, almost drag and drop, to replicate your workflows uh, and your structures of authority inherent to your organization. Um, so, for example, um, you have a trader A or you have an investment manager A that is only allowed to trade certain assets X uh, up to a volume of, of 500K and um, the same for a trader B or investment manager B who uh, trades assets uh, of the class uh, Y. Again, only up to 500K and if they go over 500K, you need to have an, um, manager, another manager director to to agree on it and maybe if you go now then over five million you have a you have four eyes principle among directors to to choose or to to affirm or um deny a trade and so we put a lot of effort into that part and also because we know that family offices are very you know it's trust is such a big it's probably the biggest um USP you can have in finance, right? Like trust is everything it comes down to. If I don't trust you, there's no way we're going to make business in any way. So we, we, we think again about how we can create this trust and how we can help our clients to, to build on their trust and to expand the trust that the client have in them. So what we created is, um, uh, it is a special app or is a special app that you can give as a wide level solution. You can put your own logo onto it to, uh, to your clients and then, um, that they can follow your transaction and see, okay, well, how is my portfolio uh, developing and how uh, and where are we with my assets? And so we really want to have to build this, this four family offices so that you can work with your clients. Just quickly, because there's many, many advantages over either working with a single provider or self-custody. Of course, we'll have one interface where you can work with, with where you can see all different custodians. You might be have, have a, one, an interface if you work with single custodians because it doesn't require to you to have any in-house tech because it's a SaaS model. We have all the tech. Um, some custodians have insurance, uh, some don't. Uh, we have a we work on a feature which we call the rebalancing mechanism, which ensures that you never exceed the insured sum on one custodian. You, of course, can split your risk. Uh, you have a client view account. Um, what I just said with that. You have a flexible switch you probably do not have with a single custodian because you have long-term contracts. And we have also a kind of a cumulated negotiation power because as more clients uh, we, we have, as better deals we can get ourselves from, from, from our partners. And of course, this is the, the all-in-one uh, storing and trading or storing part. And now I want to go quickly with the CR, five minutes left. On the, on the trading part, the Blocks as Core is the flagship um, product of our mother company. And what it does, what makes it so amazing is that, as you see, you know, like we, we, are, we always think in the same, in the same kind of, of patterns, always in, in these, in these uh, yeah, networks in the end. And what decrease is for custody, 
cores for, for exchanges. So we have over, we've connected over 50 major exchanges to our trading desks. And this allows you a lot. So first of all, you can trade whatever you want, wherever you want. However, and now that, that becomes much uh, better this way, uh, there's a smart old order in algorithms. So when you set an order, we execute it across all different exchanges and you can take uh, advantage of arbitrage prices. So you're not in a situation where you just trade on a, on a single exchange and end up changing price or you know finding out that you could have bought the same assets in a different exchange for better price, but you get the best price across all the 50 connected exchanges. Um, and thus you can also set up bigger orders. You also work with a partner bank um, to make it easy for you to, to make a fiat exchange um, and then to, to trade your currencies. Uh, we have one interface again uh, we, we can all do all these things out of, out of one unique uh, mold. Uh, we also supply with market data. I, I was speaking earlier from uh, it, it's difficult sometimes to evaluate uh, the Bitcoin. And here you see uh, you, have, you have more market data to maybe help you with it. And it's bulletproof when it comes to regulation. We're very, very, we're very close with the BAF and other regulators to, to create a product that, um, that caters to all your needs. Um, of course, one of the last slides, pricing. Um, because network, um, we, we will take 20 basis points of, of assets under management, um, while block size core will um, be around there for, for 10 um, basis points uh, of assets under management, or assets that are traded, uh, assets under custody and assets in, uh, traded. And yeah, I was um, saying it already, I posted it already, I'm very much happy if you like to uh, continue this conversation maybe now then in, in much more detail um, in, an, in an extra one-to-one -one meeting. Um, if not, you can also visit us in our Frankfurt or Berlin office. We're always very keen to, to welcome you and to get to know you. Um, trust is everything. And yeah, quickly, I have to do that. I love my team and I think team, teams are everything. So Simon Peters, I have an incredible talent and uh, CTO Martin Valenta, one of the smartest persons I've ever met. And Christopher has been a great mentor to me. Um, he's the managing director of Broxus Capital, our mother company, and then also one of the smartest uh, people I've met in my life. And again, I invite you very much to connect to me on LinkedIn and continue these conversations after this uh, small 45 minutes workshop. I see it's almost the last minute. Um, what I want to say to you is this, is, as I said, has been our first workshop of this kind. I'm really curious about feedback. Um, my main question is, um, for you personally, would you, where would you wish if we would make a follow-up uh, workshop, where would you wish that we go deeper? Where are now the questions that, that I've maybe opened up but I've not answered? Like this is, this is what I'm very, very curious about. And yeah, wonderful. I think this was, uh, we we're almost perfectly on time. And um, I think I will go now afterwards and, and take me some time for, for the WhatsApp messages. Okay, I will, I will um, answer the question now that I saw. Um, MD has asked me the lack of dividends, um, interest a problem for Bitcoin evaluation. Is it the same for gold? Yes, yeah, smart question. Um, if you want to see the Bitcoin as gold, then it's not a problem. But the question is, I mean, it's opinion, right? It, it, it's in the end, it's, it's an opinion. If, if you want to see it like gold, then it's not a problem. If you want to see it as a currency, then an interest rate would be good. So it is what Bitcoin wants to be. And I do think that lending will pick up uh, on one point uh, because of the other things that we said, that, that it's impossible to, to, to censor a transaction um, and the other reasons. So I do think we maybe see some um, interest rates coming up at one point because you wouldn't borrow gold, right? Um, but if, if yeah, it, it, we'll, we'll see how it turns out. You know, maybe it just becomes a gold, maybe it will become the standard. I think the next three months will decide it. If we don't see interest rates in the next three months, uh, in the next three years, sorry, the next three years coming up, then I don't think we'll see them ever. And then, it, then the Bitcoin will have established itself as gold. And I, uh, I absolutely believe that the Bitcoin was there. I, I myself, I'm happy owner of a, of a few coins. So, uh, and I will hold them. Thank you very much. If you have any more questions, um, I'm very happy to answer them. And um, 
uh, was, a, was, was, was wonderful. Thank you very much, Jan, for, for this connection. And yeah, I, thanks. Thanks for being here today and um, talking about this topic. I hope um, at least some of you could, could take some learnings away on, on why this would make sense. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for joining. I hope to see you again at one of our future events and have a great start into the day. As, as, as mentioned before, if you have questions, put them in the WhatsApp group. Simon will be there. Yeah, I will, I will for the next hour also still answer the WhatsApp group. Yeah, you can also message him directly if, um, if you want to keep it private. All right, that's it from, from my side as well. Thanks, Simon, for, for the talk, and I see you again at the next event.